that's kind of the insanity that's going on with the markets right now. And so, yes, to your point, at some point, if in the next few quarters or the next couple of years, NVIDIA misses earnings, or for some reason, there's a, a new competitor shows up, takes business away from them, whatever it is, that ultimately causes a shift in either outlook or a shift in the actual revenue growth of the business, it'll take the whole, it'll take this whole market with it, assuming that this market hardy hasn't come to that decision beforehand and figured out that, you know, the market is more important than just one stop. Welcome to Thoughtful Money. I'm Thoughtful Money founder and your host, Adam Taggart, welcoming you back at the end of another week, joined as usual by my Odyssean friend, portfolio manager, Lance Roberts. Lance, how are you doing? I'm doing good today. How are you? Good. I thought Odyssean was particularly fitting for you for two reasons. Okay. Um, one, as you shared last week, you are uh, heading off to Greece uh, this summer for uh, yeah. your own tour of the Mediterranean. Um, right. Hopefully it's uh, not quite as wandering and meandering as Odysseus's was. But also Odysseus is the name of the lunar lander that just landed on the moon last night. And humans, uh, Americans, are uh, back on the moon for the first time in 50 years. Uh, unmanned spacecraft at this point, humans to follow hopefully next year. Um, you know, it's uh, it's one of those things that like uh, really gives me hope for our species. I mean, it only took us like my entire lifetime uh, for us to get back to the moon. So I think... Uh, a lot of people share my frustration. I don't know why it took so long after all the momentum that we built up in the uh, late 60s and early 70s. Uh, but we're back and that opens a lot of, uh, you know, potential for the human species experiment going forward from here. But anyways, I thought Odysseus was uh, Odyssean was very fitting for you. Yeah, it's pretty amazing, actually, though, because, you know, you figure all the computing power we have today, um, all the technology, artificial intelligence that you know, we put a man on the moon. That's pretty incredible. Just to remember, though, that we were putting men on the moon back in the 50s and 60s with slide rules. So, you know, and, yeah. and computing power of an HP calculator. Uh, so, you know, it's, I think like a coffee maker, you know, at yeah, this point, yeah. you know, it, it's pretty amazing. And, you know, it's been this 50 year gap and we've had to relearn. Basically, we had to relearn everything to put men back on the moon that we had developed, you know, previous, because all those, a lot of those scientists and engineers, they died. <laughs> so They did. And remember, we haven't put men massive. back on the moon yet or people oh, no. back on the moon yet. That's still coming. Hopefully we no, will. But Exactly. And, no, it, it, of course, this has fed all the conspiracy theorists into, you know, overdrive that, oh, yeah, now we can put a man on the moon. But, you know, we didn't actually do it, you know, 50 years ago. It was uh, Hollywood doing it behind the scenes. So. Well, I'm curious. Are, are they believing that it's not a soundstage uh, now? Uh, uh, you know, don't know yet. Not sure. We'll see. We'll see what TikTok says in a few days. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, look, um, uh, in the uh, spirit of momentous developments, um, I, I don't think I can ask you about the week without starting with NVIDIA. Sure. So NVIDIA had their earnings and, uh, you know, the world was beginning to kind of bite its nails saying, oh, is this is this the time when the giant's going to show some weakness? And it didn't. And uh, we had like the biggest market cap gain in history or something like that. So nice. tell us what's going on. Uh, second largest market cap gain for a stock in a single day next to Meta, which happened 26 days ago when they announced earnings. So, you know, it, it's just look, a lot of... Uh, a lot of excitement behind the markets and, you know, a lot of speculative uh, positioning. We had the options going crazy on NVIDIA before the actual earnings announcement. So, you know, we actually took some profits <clears throat> just before the earnings announcement, both NVIDIA and AMD, just simply because, you know, there was so much specula speculation they were going to crush earnings, which they did, that even just some weak guidance would have probably led to a Palo Alto type downturn where the stock was down 26% in a day. So, you know, it was a little bit of prudent profit taking prior to the announcement, but, you know, again, great. After the announcement, stock was up sharply, up 15% yesterday. Uh, AMD was right along with it. I think it was up 11 or 12% yesterday. Uh, we bought some Palo Alto um, on the downturn um, when it was down 25, 26%. It was up yesterday in, in kind of conjunction with the whole AI trade. So. Again, there's absolutely, you know, nothing wrong with this market right now. So no no need to be fear, fearful of it. Oh, well, okay. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Because I'm going to ask you um, sure. about a couple of things. Um, but but maybe I'll jump to uh, this one, which is 
uh, one of the two of us just put out a video called a magnificent bubble. <laughs> so when you say nothing to worry about here, what exactly do you mean? Because I think you do have some concerns. So, well, uh, you know, the, you know, right now, the short term trend is very positive. We came down, we tested the 20 day moving average here. We'll just let's look at our chart for the week. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can take a look at, you know, this market and ever since really the October lows and, and you know, last of this time last year, that the market's just traded right along the 20 day moving average. And every time we've come down and tested that 20 day moving average, that's been key support for the market. The market moves higher. We break out to a new high. It's exactly what happened, uh, you know, on Tuesday, Wednesday is that on Thursday is that we came down on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, tested that 20 day moving average bounced off of it on Thursday and then on Friday, you know, opened up a little bit higher. Now markets are selling off a little bit early on Friday. So, but that's not surprising after such a big gain, the markets were up almost 2% um, and 3% on the NASDAQ. So a little bit of a give back on, on that big kind of rush into the market yesterday, not surprising. But again, from a, just from a short-term trend perspective, there's absolutely nothing to be fearful of about the market. And, and again, the only, you know, the only your kind of your key indicator just to pay attention to is if, you know, this market's going to give us a bigger correction, it'll be a break below the 20 day moving average. And then we'll probably be talking about it, uh, testing the 50 and potentially uh, retracing back to the 200. At some point um, this year, a retest of the 200 day moving average is not going to be surprising at all, but just not in the next few days. OK, um, so, yeah, so that's what I sort of wanted to ask you about this, which is. How as a capital manager are you riding this right now? And are you making any material changes to your portfolio based upon what just happens? So it sounds like not. Sounds like you took a little bit off the table right before, just in case there was a disappointment. There wasn't. You still obviously have long positions in yep. NVIDIA and, and uh, some of these other related stocks. Um, I guess you're just going to say you're going to keep riding while the momentum continues going. Uh, and then if the momentum starts to slow, then you'll reevaluate. Right. And and again, you know, look, we, when we since we added NVIDIA, I mean, NVIDIA is up almost 30, oh, 30 or 40 percent since the beginning of the year. I mean, so. You know, we had a position in the portfolio that had grown outside of its target weighting. And so all we did was trim it back to target weight. Same thing for AMD. AMD's had a, a huge run this year. It's up 50, 60 percent since the beginning of the year as well. Um, but, you know, we trim that back to its regular weighting. And, and that's just, you know, how we manage risk is that when things get out of balance, or out of tolerance relative to the target weightings, we just trim it back to the target weight, take a little bit of money off the table and then. At some point, NVIDIA will give us a nice, you know, either a pullback or consolidation. And because we've owned NVIDIA in the past, right? We owned NVIDIA back at the October 2022 lows. It went up 100%. We sold it, waited for a correction, came back in, bought it again. And, and, and so, you know, those are the, you know, that's just how we manage the risk in the portfolio. But, you know, we realize at some point we're going to get a broader downturn. But and, and at that point, we'll reduce overall equity risk. But right now, momentum indicators are fine. The trend is positive. Um, there's certainly some some concerns out there. Technically, I mean, we have uh, you know a bit of negative divergence between momentum indicators and the markets. We have a bit of negative divergence between the stocks above their you know the, the breadth of the market relative to the S and P. So there's certainly some concerns out there. We're watching those very closely. But from a market perspective and from a, a portfolio positioning perspective, you know, trying to to short this market is just a terrible bet right now. All right. So um, I, I, I want to kind of keep pulling at this thread to try to differentiate sort of Lance, the the technical trader, uh, you know, versus Lance, the portfolio strategy guy. Right. There, and so there's, there's 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 not I'm not a technical trader. So we use technicals in our portfolio management, but we don't trade. So, I mean, I'm not buying a stock today and selling it tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. And it, I didn't mean that. I, I meant more sort of like um, trading the market as it is <laughs> versus, you know, what your your logic and scope of history says maybe to watch out for. And, and kind of what I'm, what I'm talking about here, um, let me see if I can share my screen here real quickly. Um, I, I'm going to, I'm going to counter your chart here uh, with, with a highly technical meme. Um so you probably saw this when it when it was uh, going around, Lance, um, the elephant here on the beach ball. Yep. You able to see this? Yeah. Um, so you've seen this, right? It, it, this is sort of the 
a visualization of, of, of the, you know, thinking here that the whole market is, is basically being held up now at one point by, but practically one stock, right? We've talked about how the breadth has gotten so narrow. And of course, that stock is really being pushed higher by uh, the whole euphoria around AI and how it's going to transform everything. So, you know, in the video here, we get these little ants that are holding up the beach ball that are then holding up the entire elephant, right? Um, and I, I, I do want to give you a chance to give any commentary about the video that you put out there called a magnificent bubble. Like, I, I presume that you still have concerns of like, yes, yeah, super concentrated market. Maybe you're hearing echoes of, of past uh, euphoric eras in, in the market, whether it was the dot-com era, whether it was the Nifty 50. Um, but you've got to make money in the environment that is, not the environment you think should be. So that's what I'm trying to parse here or help people understand how you think about both. Yeah, no, no. I mean, you know, there's certainly worries. And if we take a look at, at long term trends of the markets, et cetera, you know, there's certainly always a correlation between ultimately valuations and, and forward returns and those type of things. And you go back to the to the to the late to really the mid 70s, you know, 74, 75, you had a big bear market. Well, prior to that was the nifty 50 and the nifty 50 were the you know, basically the 50 largest blue chip stocks. It was Polaroid and Procter and Gamble and uh, Xerox. And the, these were the leaders of, of kind of the new era at that point. It was the nifty 50 bubble at that time. And that can last quite a long time. Now, eventually the market's corrected because the expectations of what was going on and, and what was actually happening obviously diverged. And, and so prices had to catch down with reality. Of course, there was a lot of things going on, the oil embargo, inflation, those type of things. But it was, it was eventually the realization of you know, what companies could actually earn versus what they were earning that, that became problematic. And, and we saw the same thing in the dot-com bubble in 98, 99, actually starting in 95, you know, for five years, the market just ran up kind of nonstop into 2000. And what eventually got the market was Enron. And Enron was the thread that kind of pulled the veil back. And we started going, hey, well, if Enron's earnings aren't real, what about WorldCom and Lucent and, uh, you know, uh, Global Crossing and all these other dot-com companies, just how good are those earnings? And all of a sudden, we had to reprice that fantasy that we had created for all these stocks that they were never going to grow into the revenue. The difference this time is that NVIDIA is making the revenue. They had, they announced more revenue in one quarter than they did for an entire year last year. So, you know, they're growing revenue leaps and bounds. <clears throat> and you take a look at Meta's earnings, they're growing revenue sharply. And so a big difference between what's happening now and what happened in the dot-com bubble and what happened back in the Nifty 50 was that the revenue growth is actually very strong here. Now, having said that, it doesn't mean there's not a mismatch between what's going on with revenue and what we're paying for it. So uh, again, you know, NVIDIA announced great revenue, great sales, but their price to sales ratio basically remained unchanged because they ran up the price of the stock to compensate for the increase in sales. So there's still a mismatch between the sales growth of these companies and what investors are paying for them. And that'll eventually come home to roost at some point. At some point in the future, NVIDIA is going to go, hey, we only grew revenue this month at 100% versus right. 100%. <laughs> because that's just the law. Well, that's just the law of large numbers. I mean, right. you know, unless you're going to own, own the entire AI market, which will never be the case, <clears throat> you know, there's going to be a slowdown in revenue growth. And at some point, price and, and valuation will have to meet. But that could be dramatically higher from here before that happens. Well, and, and let me ask you about this. I, I need to bring on an AI expert and, and really crawl into their heads. But um, <clears throat> uh, kind of two questions for you. One, on, on the AI market in general, it, it seems that the market just keeps expanding its estimate of what the size of the value unlock that that AI is going to bring, right? Um, so uh, part yeah, no, no, nobody knows. And, and at this point, you know, I mean, Nvidia, what did it gain more market value than like Coca Cola yesterday or something like that? Like it's it, it's just, it's just massive. I hear all these comparisons. I, I can't remember anymore off the top of my head, but it's like, oh yeah, it's worth more than all the energy companies in the world. It was just crazy things like that, right? So, yeah. one is you know. Are we are we kind of getting ahead of our skis in terms of how much how transformative we think AI is going to be, especially because, you know, again, I don't follow the industry enough to say that I'm 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 really that informed on it. But 
criticism I have is somewhat similar to sort of what I hear about Bitcoin, where you say like, well, you can't buy much with it, you know, in, in the real world. Like a lot of people are like, I'm not seeing AI really making my life better in that many ways right now. Right. Yeah. So is it really going to unlock as much value as people think? And then secondly, and you've, you've mentioned this a couple of times, which is, you know, NVIDIA is sort of the big dog right now. Um, but will they always be like, I mean, it, competitors aren't just going to sit on their hands and will, you know, their margins start getting competed away as more and more people go after this cold rush. Well, yeah, absolutely. So let's take the second question first, because yes, uh, success breeds competition. Uh, and so there's going to be other players that, that look, there are already other players in the market. AMD is a good example. Um, there'll be other players that come to market. You know, this CHIPS Act is very interesting because, you know, we passed this CHIPS Act. Well, right now, all you have to do to get money from CHIPS Act is basically supply a PowerPoint to the government that says you're going to build chips and they'll send you money. And so we have a lot of companies getting formed right now that generate no revenue whatsoever, uh, but they're using government money to do that. Um, you know, but there's going to be other competitors that come into the market, either domestically or, or foreign, to compete in the space. Because again, if somebody's going to, look, this is all in, you know, if you look at NVIDIA, you look at AMD and these other companies, um, and Apple's such a great example of this. Apple doesn't create product, to, so to speak. Um, you know, you take a look at Samsung as an example. They're about five years ahead of whatever Apple's producing. Apple produces pretty much what everybody else produces. They just do a better job at it. They they build a, a better mousetrap. They have better designers. But their technology is no better than anybody else. But they've built this very loyal fan base because they build a little bit better product. And so there's going to be another competitor that comes along and says, hey, NVIDIA builds a great product. But I'm going to build one that's a little bit, just a smidge better. I'm going to charge less for it. And that's going to eat into market share. So, and, and again, because at some point, and, and again, most of these GPUs are going into cloud storage and a lot of the data centers. Um, that's very, that's a very low moat to entry to, to build a data center. All I got to do is go rent a warehouse, throw in some computers, build, you know, throw some chips in, some GPUs, and I can have a data center. So there's a very, there's a, a very weak moat to 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 or that barrier to entry that exists in this technology. So, you know, there's going to be for people that don't have, you know, billions of dollars like Amazon or Apple or Microsoft to spend on Nvidia chips to build data centers, there's going to be smaller companies that are willing to use a, a, a slightly inferior chip that costs less money to build their da data centers, right? Because that's a revenue, that, that's something they can create revenue on. And the more that we continue to do stuff on the internet and, you know, TikTok and social media and, you know, uh, door dashing and whatever else that we can figure out to put on an app, you're going to need more and more data centers. So this is just in video games. Uh, you know, video games are a huge data center issue. So, you know, the more that we move in that direction, the more demand that's going to be. But again, again, the, the, the efficiency will increase, cost will come down, profitability will decline eventually. But again, we're very, very early in all of this. And to your point, now to the first question, is that nobody knows what the size of this thing is because we've never done this before. But we've done the internet before. And if you go back to the dot-com era, if you were alive back then, like I was, you know, the internet was going to, you know, make everything better. And it was going to replace everything. And, and don't worry about job loss because if you lose your job in engineering, that's okay. You just go learn how to program a website because at that time, if you were graduating college in 1998, 1999, you were getting a job as a web programmer for $300,000 a year. You were getting a BMW. Uh, companies were giving you a house to live in, the whole nine yards, because there was such a demand for those web-based programmers. Now, those are not high-paying jobs anymore because everybody can do it. And now AI can do it. So, you know, that. So when we go through these innovations, they sound great. It's like, oh, this is going to change everything. It's okay if you lose your job you know, go get a job in AI because that's going to be it. But again, there's only a finite number of jobs that are going to be available because of that. And that technology will ultimately displace more jobs than it creates. And that's what we've been seeing with the employment since 2000. We've seen that the full-time employment relative to the population continually decline ever since the peak of the dot-com bubble. Wages have declined. Standard of livings have declined. Nothing's gotten better because of the internet. It's gotten more convenient. But it's, in terms of economic prosperity, has not gotten better unless you're in the top 10% of the uh, of the economy. Okay. 
Um, all right. So the, my, where it's kind of going on this is, you know, let's, let's use the dot com as an example. I mean, the internet did revolutionize absolutely a ton of things, right? Um, and you had companies like Amazon, you know, that, that proved to be fantastic long term winners. But like many other companies, you know, their, their price got sent to the moon and then took a massive correction as we entered into the dot com bus and took many years to get back on track and but and now now it's doing great right and nvidia may be that type of company it might be the the big dog still in this space 20 years from now but right. my point is is are are we seeing sort of history repeat itself here well don't forget nvidia lost more than half its value in 2022 yeah it had a huge correction uh stock was $100 a share in november of 2022 it's now 650, 680, whatever it closed at yesterday. So, I mean, you know, um, it's had that big correction because because prior to that correction, remember in, you know, prior to that correction, we were talking about stocks in 2019. They were at ridiculous highs. We're talking about a melt up in the market going into 2020. And, you know, technology was leading the way and, and you know, everybody, everybody was uber bullish. And then we had the pandemic. So, you know, the, we, we've never corrected that bullish trend and we've never resolved these long-term extensions from the exponential, you know, uh, growth trend line of the markets. But, you know, we keep having these corrections along the way that kind of give people fuel to start buying these stocks again. Uh, so I agree. And looking here at NVIDIA, which actually is trading up near 800 now, right? Yeah, it's uh, it, it went from 300 to your point, down to below 150, right? Uh, yep. 125 or so, right? So that was a very big correction. Um, but at this point, you can make a pretty good argument <laughs> that it's really gotten ahead of itself here. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, but if you could pull, can, can you pull up a chart on that of, say, uh, Amazon going back to 1995-ish? Sure. Can, I give you a, can you get a long-term chart? I think I can, yeah. We're probably not uh, going to be able to see it on this chart because of the splits, but we'll see see what we can find. So yeah, you can't really see it, but Amazon lost like eighty percent of its value during the dot com crash. Apple did the same thing. Try Apple, maybe the the problem is the scale of the chart and stock splits and all that, which really is is muted to declines. But you know, you kind of go back to that time frame. You know, these stocks lost tremendous value during the dot com bust, and people thought they were dead. There you go. Yeah, I'm uh I'm swing twenty three still. Yeah, I'm I'm I was kinda hoping I could find easy way to find a date range here. Oh, date range. All right, keep keep talking and I'll yeah, I'll yeah. I'll pull this so, up yeah, here. But, but yeah, so but back in that, that period, a lot of these stocks, you know, basically got decimated and it took twenty years for them to get back to even. A good example, you know, Cisco Systems um peaked out in, in nineteen ninety nine. It still hasn't recovered back to its all time highs yet. So, you know, these things can can get absolutely decimated and then take over. There you go. Now you can see a little bit better. But yeah, that's Amazon. So you lost almost all of its value. And then it took a very, very long time for it to recoup all that. And then and and ultimately, that's what's going to happen with NVIDIA. Um, no doubt about it. At some point, there'll, there's going to be, you know, when the stock's trading at 35 times price to sales where it is currently, it's going to have a big correction, you know, it, it, you, you know, 300 to 125, you know, there's your, there's your correction. So 800 to 200, that's going to be your next correction at some point. And people are going to start talking about, oh, FANG stocks are dead. It's all over. There, nobody, everybody hates AI. And then the stock will recover again at some point. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, I, I do want to make the point that raise the question that, that let's say 800 to 200 happens, right? Yeah. I think that may have a much bigger effect on the markets this time around than uh, 300 to, to 125 for NVIDIA two years ago, just because oh, yeah. NVIDIA is so much more market now than it was well, back then, right? It, We're in the magnificent well, four now, right? <laughs> yeah, well, no, it, it is, but it's also the function that, like, for instance, you know, yesterday was, was a very interesting day uh, in the market because... Uh, when when the market was going up, and this is all about Nvidia yesterday, right? So Nvidia is you know screaming off to the moon, and you know you take let me pull up a heat map from yesterday real quick and share my screen. So yeah, here's a here's a a picture of the heat map from yesterday, and you know what? The, so Nvidia, you see Nvidia, it's up. You know when I took when I took this snapshot, it wasn't quite. It was a little bit before the close, 
But NVIDIA is up 14% at this point. Broadcom's up six. AMD's up 11. Um, you know, but what does NVIDIA's earnings have to do with Eli Lilly, which was, <laughs> which was up 3.5% yesterday, or Visa, which was up over 2% yesterday? And so, you know, what's happening with the markets now is that it's like, oh, NVIDIA is up. Let's buy everything. And so people are piling into, you know, stocks that are in the, you know, the top 10 stocks. You're buying MGK as an example, which is, you know, kind of focused on those big mega cap weighted companies. So when I start piling money into MGK to participate with the NVIDIA trade, it fuels all these other companies. And so Microsoft and Meta and Amazon and Lilly, they, you know, they all get a hit from that from that uh, impact, but that's the impact of that passive investing that we've talked about before. But that's kind of the insanity that's going on with the markets right now. And so, yes, to your point, at some point, if in the next few quarters or the next couple of years, NVIDIA misses earnings, or for some reason there's a, a new competitor shows up, takes business away from them, whatever it is, that ultimately causes a shift in either outlook or a shift in the actual revenue growth of the business, It'll take the whole. It'll take this whole market with it, assuming that this market hardy hasn't come to that decision beforehand and figured out that you know the market is more important than just one stop. Okay, I'm going to ask you um, one more question about um, you know market nervousness, and then we'll move on here. Sure. Um, so, because the vibe, the strong vibe I'm getting from you is, um, hey, you know what, like. You can make money in this market. The bulls are running. You know, let's let's make money while the bulls are running. Yep. Um, you recently, I think actually just this morning, uh, just published a piece uh, saying, hey, you know, small cap stocks are looking pretty risky here, um, according to uh, uh, conference board data. Um, so elaborate on that. So it's, it well, sounds like you're not too worried about the big dogs right now, but the, well, but the no, small but there, you are. There's a, yeah, there's a massive difference. And so one of the things that really kind of caught my eye this this past week, and let me see if I can just find a quick chart on it. Um, and, and as you're, as you're, as you're answering, let, let me let me put this question on the table for you to answer as well, which is why care about small cap stocks, right? Like if, if the big guys who drive the indices are running, ah, so what about those guys, right? Let's just all be in the big guys and everything's going to be fine. Yeah. Well, you know, again, we're mostly invested in large caps and but you know, small caps though are very economically sensitive and and this is actually the the article that's out on the website on Friday um and here I'll, I'll let me just pull it up here real quick because there's a couple of charts we'll go through. This is actually part 1 of a part 2 article. Um they 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 cover the small caps in a couple of different positions. But you know the, the the important thing is is that small caps are very economically sensitive, and that's the the first part of this article is really talking about that economic sensitivity, because small caps don't have the ability to do things like massive corporate stock buybacks. They they don't have the capital for it, um, and in a lot of these cases. And uh, a good friend of ours over at uh, Kailash Concepts uh, just recently sent me a chart for part two of this article showing that for nearly 40% of the Russell 2000 index has negative earnings growth. So when you're buying these, there's a huge difference between buying NVIDIA as an example, is that they just generated $22 billion in a quarter, right, in revenue. And you take a look at one of the other stocks that are going off to the moon lately, and this is the latest meme stock, which is Super Microcomputer Inc., because it said it had something to do with AI. And so <laughs> all the meme traders jumped into it. This stock went from 300 to almost 1,100 in less than a month. And of course, it sold off here a bit recently because they announced earnings that weren't nearly as good. The stock went from 1,100 to 700, tried to bounce back up a bit. Classic kind of topping process for the stock. But if we take this... As, NVIDIA, right? That just generated 22 billion in a quarter. Um, you know, this company is, trades at, you know, just massive multiples. It is growing earnings, but it's not growing earnings nearly fast enough to justify an $1,100 price share. And so the, you know, and for a lot of these companies, they have negative earnings growth on top of this. So, you know, if you take a look at economic cycles, which is, you know, really this whole theme behind uh, the small cap stocks is that in an early economic recovery, as the economy is really getting traction, 
small caps tend to do fairly well at market peak, at, at near economic peaks where you're expecting slower rates of economic growth. That's where large cap momentum, those type of things are doing well because those are the ones that can generate the most earnings or are generating the most earnings and revenue growth kind of near that peak economic cycle. So what are we talking about over the next year or two? We're talking about higher Fed interest rates, eventually and that lag effect on the economy that slows down the economy, you get slower rates of earnings growth. And the companies most impacted by that are the companies that, you know, trade, you know, in that smaller cap space. And they're the ones that have the, the are most directly impacted and have the biggest impact of spending by consumers for their products. And, you know, over the last, and again, you know, just recently we're seeing a lot of investors pile into small and mid caps are speculating that, oh, this is going to be the catch up trade. Small caps are going to catch up rapidly to the large caps now because large caps are getting too far ahead of themselves. But that's been a bad trade ever since 2014. Large caps have outperformed small, mid, and the Russell 2000 consecutively over that entire time frame. So this whole idea that, you know, it's going to be this ultimate catch up is fine. And we have gotten and we have seen performance pick up in small and mid caps. And we own a few uh, in our portfolio. But the long term ability to outperform large caps isn't there because they can't do stock buybacks, which since 2014, really going back to 2011, stock buybacks have accounted for about 40 percent of the price increase in the S&P 500. That's why the S&P 500 is outperforming small and mid caps that can't contribute that much to doing it. Um, but this goes to a, a, a bigger concern which is the National Federation of Independent Business and, and something that you know we've talked you and I have talked about before. Small businesses make up about 50% of the employment in the US. So when, when you talk about the BLS survey, they're basically interviewing a, a handful of companies to get some of their employment data from it. And they're interviewing large companies. So that really kind of skews the BLS employment results from what's actually happening on the ground. The vast majority of businesses have fewer than ten employees. So that's your, you know, your 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 barber shops, your salons, your nail salons, your you know, your, your small mom and pop retail stores, etc. That's a big bulk of the economy that that generates employment. And so the National Federation of Independent Business surveys those businesses and says, "Well, how are you feeling about things?" Well, they're not very optimistic. Their their optimism level is is at recessionary levels. And not only that, we're seeing a, a, a vast difference. You know, we talk about record retail sales that are coming. I was like, oh man, retail sales are booming. The actual uh, real retail sales of what's happening with sales for small and mid-sized businesses is not good. And the percentage reporting higher sales is very low. The percentage expecting higher sales next, uh, next three months is very low and well below the long-term median of what these businesses do now. Remember, sales is what drives optimism for the business. If I'm spend, if I'm making a lot of sales, then I'm going to invest in my business. But you don't see that capex plans as a real as a, a versus real gross domestic private investment. It's declining. Now, if we were in a strongly booming economy, that would be increasing, not declining. And particularly for small businesses that would be benefiting from a stronger economy, they'd be investing more in their business, building out a second shop, whatever it is, and you know, we've heard a lot of, of stories about, oh, well, you know, small business, there's all these job openings out there. And, you know, look, small businesses are always optimistic. I've told you before that if you're if you're going to be in business, you can't be a pessimist, right? You've got to be an optimist. But there's a huge disconnect between when they interview these small companies, they said, hey, you plan on hiring anybody? Well, if the economy is as good as I'm hearing about, yeah, I'm going to hire some people. Okay. Over the next three months, you're going to hire some more people. Awesome. How many did you hire last three months? So if I asked you this three months ago and you said you were going to hire more people, did you? And that answer is no. So there's this big gap between the number of what firms are saying that they're going to hire versus what they actually do. And the number mm -hmm. they were saying they were going to hire is declining. So none of that, none of that translates into a, a stronger economic environment for small caps. And, and we take a look at sales expectations versus the annual change in earnings. That suggests some problem, you know, that that earnings growth this year may turn out to be substantially weaker than what uh, companies are, are, you know, what Wall Street analysts uh, analysts are expecting. And there's a there's a very long historical correlation between the NFIB year over year change in the uh, NFIB index versus small caps. 
And we've had, you know, you can see that big run we've had lately in small caps. It aligned with the the, the very small increase that we saw in, in uh, NFIB confidence. But if NFIB confidence starts to retard later this year because economic growth slows down, concerns about sales continues, et cetera, you're going to see small caps come back under pressure because that's who those businesses are. So let me... I got two questions here, and and I'm probably going to be guilty of munging them together again here, but I'll, <laughs> I'll mention them both, and you can answer any way you like. We'll segregate them. Yeah. Well, so first off, there's just sort of this sense of like, um, uh, you know, we had we had the the emergence of the term "too big to fail," right, in the banking system, come out in in 2008. Right, like, hey, the, the the big guys who have a lot of advantages, um, you know, when they get into trouble, we got to help them out, right? And that yep. that really enraged a lot of people, right? Understandably. <clears throat> um, then we had the pandemic shutdown, and it was sort of like, hey, you know, we, we can't go out and frequent businesses, um, but we got to get the we got to allow these big guys to continue operating, right? So we we really decimated a lot of small and medium sized businesses, put them at an extreme dis disadvantage, put the big guys at an even greater advantage, right? right. And 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 they in this type of of market uh, with these type of financial conditions, the big guys again have the advantage, right? They've got the ability to do this buybacks and things like that, right? So. You know, understandably, I think investors are basically saying, like, well, 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 why deal with those small cap companies, right? We, let's just deal with the big guys, right? So there seems to be this inherent unfairness and, and maybe sort of, you know, a deterioration of balance. And, uh, you know, do, do we want to have a, a, an economy that is increasingly concentrating to just a few really big behemoths, right? I, I could make the argument, no, we don't want that. So maybe I'll pause and let you respond to that for a second. No, it, it's, uh, no, I agree with you. You know, uh, again, you know, small and mid mid-sized businesses are the backbone of the economy. And, you know, I have a, look, I have a huge problem with Amazon, um, you know, personally, just not, I mean, like, I don't have personal animosity towards Amazon, but I'm just saying, personally, there's a problem that Amazon keeps, you know, kind of just overtaking more and more areas of the market. And, you know, from a capitalism side of it is like, okay, well, that's capitalism at work. I mean, this company has been very successful. They see an opportunity in, the, in a business area, et cetera. But the problem is, is their footprint is now so large that they're displacing any possibility for a competitor to come in into that space. And so that's, that's when we have monopoly laws in place. And there's certainly, you could probably make a case for a monopolistic claim against Amazon. But at the same time, right, Amazon provides a lot of ability for, you know, for instance, you, you could go write a book and then drop ship it on Amazon. So, you know, Amazon provides you an ability to basically start your own small businesses of publishing books on thoughtful money, right? You know, here's my series of books on how to invest better or whatever. And you can publish, self-publish those and, you know, bypass the publishers and put those on Amazon and, and eventually get it. So, you know, that's where I'm kind of torn in that some, you know, there, there's definitely a case to be made that companies like Microsoft and Google and, and, and Facebook and others have certainly displaced opportunities for small and mid-sized businesses to exist. Um, but at the same time, they've also created a lot of, of, of business opportunities. I can, you know, I can create a business and advertise on Facebook, or I can create a business and advertise on Google or set up a YouTube channel and, and make money from my YouTube channel. You know, those are all things that, that you can do to benefit from these very large behemoth companies. So it, it's, you know, it's a very tough question to answer because you can make cases on both sides of this. Yes, they're a monopoly, bad for the economy. We should break them up, give people more advantage to start a competitive business. You know, I can start another online bookseller. Um, you know, or you look at it from the standpoint, it's like, hey, they create lots of opportunities for people to start a small business if they want to. I mean. You know, every time I open my social media, I'm flooded by a you know a stream of videos of people telling me how to digitally market, <laughs> and I can make thousands of dollars a month digitally marketing. Um, you know, and that's what. But you know, that's part of of this new society that us us old people haven't quite gravitated to yet. Yeah, well, you know, I think 
I think you used this term earlier. To me, it's sort of the siren song, a siren song of, of convenience, uh, continuing our Odysseus yeah. analogy, maybe. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, per personally, and, and it's funny, you use the example of, of me writing and drop shipping a book on Amazon. I actually did that about 12 years ago. <laughs> yeah. This book is, so, yeah, it's great. Um, but uh, it, uh, it, 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 you know, hollows out the diversity of our, of our uh, commercial base. And it's hard to prove the contra positive, which is, hey, if we had more competition, maybe we'd have even better services, yep. right? Uh, and of course, the danger of, of ending up with one or two global corps that run everything is that once they have dominant position, well, then they slow down their innovation, they crapify all their products, and there's nothing you can do about it because there's there's no competition left anymore. Right. That's a rant for a different day. Um, here's the question. Just, just, uh, just, just yeah. real quick before you leave that point. Just for anybody, just go watch the movie Idiocracy to see who yeah. actually wins the the takeover game. <laughs> it's funny. I actually was thinking of that as you were talking. I was like, ah, I don't want to beat the Idiocracy horse again. But all right, you you took another <laughs> swipe at it. Yeah. Um, that 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 movie is sadly so prophetic on so many levels. <laughs> yes, it's scary. <clears throat> um, that 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 one and Wally. -E. So watch Wally -E and Idiocracy on your weekend, and you will know exactly where the world's headed. Yeah, well, you'll probably go jump off a cliff after you do that. <laughs> um, all right. So my my other question is, is as much advantage as the the large cap companies have right now, could and I'm going to continue our our mythological references here. Could could the, the plight of the small companies actually be the Achilles heel that takes down the larger companies? And what I mean by that is, is as you talked about, you know, I, I think a majority of jobs. Uh, are provided by the small to mid cap companies. And as those companies start struggling, if, uh, if, if they have to start really cutting costs seriously and start laying off workers, and you, you, you talked about how they're not hiring nearly as much as they'd been guiding, right? Um, could that begin kind of the negative spiral of a recession that then drops consumer demand enough that that begins to pull down uh, the, the profits of the larger companies. So could that actually, well, while everyone's sort of dismissing that space, could that actually be the trigger that brings down the big guys? Yeah. Yeah. No, no doubt. Look, look, you know, recessions always start at the bottom and go up, right? It's just, we don't see it. We don't see the erosion at the bottom until it reaches the top. And, you know, ultimately you know, when we start talking about, Oh, it's a recession. Well, that's when Apple just announced, uh, you know, I'm not, Apple didn't do this by the way, but you know, when we reach the recession point, that's where Apple just announced 50,000 people they're laying off and Google's announcing mass layoffs and, you know, Facebook's announcing mass layoffs. Um, you know, but that's been happening, you know, long before in the smaller and mid-sized businesses, they were already laying off people. You know, the big risk, and this is part two of the article on Monday, is that there's this massive debt wall that's coming up for these businesses. And there's already in the first quarter of this year, a massive jump in single B issuance bonds that are being put out there. Um, and, and these small and mid-sized companies that have all this debt on their books, and these are what we call zombie companies, that you know they require debt issuance in order to stay in business, they're resorting to triple B rated bonds, um, you know, uh, leverage bonds, leverage loans, et cetera, where they can try to get a little bit lower rate and get out into the market. So, because again, you're not paid for buying junk bonds uh, in this market. You know, there's, you know, I, I hear a lot of people running around like, oh, I'm buying, you know, if you, boy, if you buy you some, some uh, triple B, you know, some double B rated or single B rated bonds, you can get 15%. Yeah, that's awesome. There's also a very high probability that you're going to get defaulted on, you're going to wind up with nothing. And, you know, that's, that's when you have to understand what you're buying into when you start talking about these risks and about 40% of these companies in the Russell 2000 have negative earnings. They can't support the debt payments that are coming up. And so if those bonds reset to much higher levels in 24, 25, 26, uh, there's a real risk of a surge in bankruptcies in that Russell 2000 space. That's your small mid cap companies. That's gonna cause that erosion that leads to that recession that you know. now, interestingly enough, my, my article for this weekend in our newsletter about the board, the conference board, who is the company that produces the leading economic index, this week gave up their recession call. They go, they well, threw in the towel. <laughs> yeah, they said, well, you know, we've had this recession call out for 23 months and no recession. So we're going to give it up. Now, the only stretch longer for 23 negative months in a row 
was 24 months during the financial crisis. And the, the LEI index went negative in April of 2007. The recession wasn't called until December of 2008. So we're still within that window for the National Bureau of Economic Research over the next 12 months to come back and say, oh, yeah, there was a recession and it started a year ago. But we won't yeah. know that for a while. Well, and, and to be clear, uh, as I understood it, they said, look, our, our, indica our indicators are still where they usually are in recessions. Yeah. It just hasn't arrived. So we're just taking the recession warning off. But like, it's not like our indicators have dramatically gotten better. Yeah. Yeah, the only, the only thing that's improved, of course, was their uh, leading credit index and because yields have come down, and the S and P five hundred, which are two components of the the ten indicators, are yield spreads, ba basically yield spreads to get lack of a better term, and the S and P five hundred. So the surge in the S and P five hundred since October of twenty twenty two is really those are the only two things. You look at wages, everything else, it's it's very negative and not really improving that much. Yeah, well, so it sounds like, you know, you are, uh, you, you share my concerns about the lag effects. And, and, and one big reason why I'm so worried about the lag effect is the maturity wall, right? And I, I've been talking about it forever. And I'm sure you've been talking about it forever. And the market clearly has given up on it, right? Not worried about it. They're not going to happen this time around, right? Um, now, uh, you know, I, I'm not ready to throw in the towel to say that the lag effect isn't going to arrive and it's not going to matter. Um, I will say it has taken a little longer to arrive than I thought it would. And we've talked a lot about the reasons why. And a lot of that's been positive net liquidity in the system and a lot of the extraordinary measures that are being taken. Um, and I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I, I kind of get the sense from you, Lance, that you think, yeah, it probably could happen. But it's probably I don't get the sense you think it's too much of a 2024 worry. Yeah. And well, that's the whole that's the whole kind of really the, the conversation in this weekend's newsletter, which is that the 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 inherent risk of a recession are still very present. But it's but because we have to reverse GDP from 12 percent to, to zero. It's just going to take longer to get to the recession. So if we're expecting much slower rates of economic growth over the next 12 to 18 months, you may not get into a recession until 2025, maybe even 2026. But, you know, a lot of that will between now and then is going to depend on, you know, how much does the Fed cut rates? Do they start reversing QT back to QE, which is kind of, you know, the hope of the market? Um, you, could we avoid a recession in that standpoint? Yeah. If you inject enough liquidity back into the markets to offset the contraction in liquidity, which is going on in terms of M2 as a percentage of GDP, that's declining still. So if you're going to if you can surplant that and start producing a lot more liquidity, you know, increase the money supply again, yeah, you can avoid a recession. But there doesn't seem to be any real, you know, incentive right now to do that. We'll see. Uh, you know, a lot of fight, you know, you're running the largest deficit outside of a war, you know, ever in history. So, you know, at some point and, the, and a lot of this will depend on who gets elected president for the next cycle. Right. So if you get a more conservative individual um, you know, into office that wants to, you know, basically reduce the deficit, get back on a budget, those type of things, which let's be honest, it's not going to happen. Um, but if it would happen by some stretch of imagination, you know, that's certainly not going to be good for the economy um, because again, we just need more debt. Wow. Thanks for the chuckle. That was great. Yeah. Um, hey, let me ask you this question that I've been asking a few people lately. Um, Here's sort of a thesis that's I'm beginning to chew on um, or hypothesis. Um, so uh, let, let's fast forward to November, right? If Biden gets reelected, um, you know, it seems that that a lot of us are intuiting that the administration is taking kind of an everything plus the kitchen sink approach to just trying to keep everything duct taped together to look as optically good as it can through the election. Right. Yeah, of course. Of course. So Biden gets reelected. Very well may say, OK, look, a lot of this stuff was super extraordinary stuff we're doing. We can't keep doing it forever. Let's start removing some of this support. Let's let some of the pressure clear. Right. We got we got four years to to make good on this. Right. So let's like take a breather. So you can argue you're, you're going to expect some sort of correction if Biden wins because he's, you know, he's, he's turning the dial off of 11. Right. Uh, back down to something a little more manageable. I don't see any indication of that. I mean, the people look. President Biden doesn't do anything. 
right? It's all the people behind it. It's, it's the whole machine. Yes. Yeah. The, and that, that whole machine is very driven to more socialistic needs, right? So, you know, you can imagine. So look, he just forgave 1.2 billion in student loan debt, even though the Supreme Court said you can't. Um, he did. And so there's another 1.2 billion of stimulus into the economy that people don't have to pay now. You can only imagine that after he gets reelected, there's going to be a big push to forgive all of the student loan debt. There's going to be a big push for increased child tax credits. There's going to be a big push for um, more medical uh, support. You know, everything that is sure. the anathema of the average American on that left hand side of the scale. There's going to be more and more push, you know, for those for those you know, goods and for those uh, supports for the markets, which is just going to be more and more money put in. And, you know, you'll you'll see the debt increase by another 10 trillion. And, you know, we're going down the road. But, you know, no, I don't I wouldn't expect a, a negative change if he gets elected. I would expect a, an acceleration and a continuation of what he's been doing the last four years. So and, and again, this is all a hypothesis. You know, my thinking yeah. is, is right now there's an urgency to get as much as you can in there, right? So yeah, yeah the hey, another 1.2 billion in student loans. Yeah, let's get those, you know, uh, approved or forgiven or whatever. Um, and so there's a real rush to just whatever we can do and any weakness. I'm calling Jerome Powell. I'm calling Yellen. Just do what you got to do, right? After the election, it's kind of like, hey, we, we got a little bit of time here, right? We got time to work on this bigger stuff. We don't need to be you know, completely right. balls to the wall that we are right now, right? So there's an ebb, right? A, a sure. potential ebb. That that that's the hypothesis. Now, okay. Trump, if Trump wins, well, first Biden stops, or the, or the 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 Democratic machine stops doing whatever it's doing, right? Because it doesn't want to, it 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 it's, it's leaving, and also it doesn't want to do anything to continue to help Trump, right? And then Trump is like, look, hey. I got, you know, I got two years before I'm being judged on my performance. Let me let me let anything that I think is unsustainable, you know, kind of bleed right here. And I get to blame it on the prior administration for a while. Right. Mm -hmm. So the question, the point is, is like we may get, you know, some sort yeah. of correction, no matter who wins coming That's after the election. Quite possible. Uh, and look, you know, predicting that far in the future is, is you know, kind of uh, falling anyway. No. But. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, this is and this is why markets tend to sell off before the election. Historically, uh, you normally get a five to 10 percent correction going into the election because nobody knows for sure who's going to get elected. And more importantly, it's not right. the president. You know, we're all focused on the president. Right. You know, it's like, oh, who's going to win, Biden or Trump? And, and that's really not what we should be talking about. It's who wins the House and the Senate, because those the guys in the House are the right guys writing the bills. The House and the Senate are the ones that are approving those bills and budgets. Those are the guys that control the money. The right. They determine the spending. Yeah. 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 So, you know, really, the big question is, is who's going to win the House and who's going to win the Senate, you know, in November? And who's going to have control of that going into what with whatever president that you have? So, again, is it going to be gridlock? That's that has a very vastly different outcome than a Democratic president with Democratic House and, and Senate. Which is typically preceded recessions, um, and you know, or do you have a you know a split Congress, or do you have a conservative, a Republican-controlled House, Senate, and President? Which you know, those are two totally different things, right? So you know, those are the those are the the issues that the market's going to try to deal with in July, August, September, October, which is why we think we're going to get a pretty decent correction before we get to the election because there's just too many unknowns going into that election this year. Well, and especially and this. Not even to mention all the social disruption that'll occur if, if Trump wins the, the presidency. What, what, that's what I was just about to say, which is, you know, I, I think you're right logically on what we should be watching more closely. But I mean, this election, right? If it's still legit, is Biden and Trump, you're going to have, you know, all the questions of like, what's it going to be like the day after the election, right? Are we going to have like a runoff? I mean, is it going to be razor thin like it's been? Are we going to have some sort of social uprising by whichever party doesn't like the the way the vote went and they think it's a stolen election right i mean this is just such a potential powder keg waiting to happen i just feel like that's what everybody is going to be focused on leading up to that and, and legitimately you know, for legitimate reasons there's a lot of reasons to be concerned yeah no and that's why i said that's and look and, and like i said normally historically markets sell off before the election and the reason is because they don't know who's going to win so they don't know what policies are going to get tax cuts tax hikes whatever I think this year it's even more the case because they really don't know what the environment, it's not policy, they don't know what the environment's going to be like after the election. So, you know, I, again, 
I think there's a real chance that we could see a decent, you know, we get this run up continues until, you know, eventually March, April, May, we could get a correction sooner, but you know, maybe we get a run through May, June, like we did last year. And then you get a sell off in the summer, like we did last year. Okay. All right. Well, obviously we'll be tracking it uh, week to week. Um, I want to get to bonds real quick. Uh, just getting off of AI for a second. Um, sure. uh, or as we get off AI, um, you know, I've raised a lot of questions about AI. Um, like I said, I, I, I want to bring on a specialist to really kind of help us all understand sort of where exactly what, what the state of AI is right now, what's hype, what's not. Um, I will say kind of a funny week. Um, you had both a mind blowing um, revelation uh, with AI uh, imagery with Sora. Did, have you seen those Sora videos, Lance? I have not. They're unbelievable like literally and in, in, i mean the word unbelievable um it's it's an ai uh image vi video creation um service i guess um but with very simple prompts uh you, you, some of the ones they showed was like sh show me a fashionable woman walking down the streets of tokyo at night and it, it generates this image in like 4k detail you would swear it was produced by like on a movie set. I mean, it, it is, it is, it, it's, it's better than real <laughs> in many ways. And they have a whole bunch more like that. You know, give me a drone shot of this famous, you know, location. Um, and it looks just like an aerial drone shot of an incredibly detailed seacoast. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's unbelievable what this thing can do. And apparently the prompts are about as simple as I just mentioned. That you, you don't have to be a, a, a sophisticated programmer to try to get this stuff. So it's it's sort of showing how fast and, and quickly AI-generated video imagery is becoming. Um, so folks, if you haven't seen it yet, just go online, just type in Sora videos and, and watch a few of the clips. They literally are mind-blowing. Now you contrast that with uh, what was it, the Google image searches that just came out, right? <laughs> that were highly skewed in terms of the ethnicities of, of uh, you know, uh, I guess it was yeah, very actually, challenging actually. to get certain ethnicities to come up. And it showed that that the programming of the AI had obviously been highly influenced by human programmers. Right. Um, and that's one of the potential issues of AI going forward is, is you know, sort of if, 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 the, if the inputs aren't great, the outputs aren't necessarily great. Um, but look, I mean, I, I, I do think, look, you know, I, I get the the um, academic promise of AI and uh, who knows how linearly we'll head to that much better future. But, you know, if you see things like Sora and you're like, oh, my God, like the, the, there's the videography industry, you know, should be lying awake at night in fear that they're just not going to uh -huh. be needed going forward. Well, no, not like that, though, the video game industry that requires programmers to, you know, build these video games, look, YouTube channels, um, all these YouTube programmers that are YouTube, you know, people that have YouTube channels don't really need talent you. on YouTube channels like you and I. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, d honestly, don't really need you, Adam. I mean, I can just write a script, load it in. And there's already programs that'll do this, but they'll basically take my script, take my image and make a complete AI generated video out of it. And it won't be me, but it'll look like me. It'll sound like me, and it'll they'll tell you everything I want you to, to know. Um, you know, so this, so you know, the problem with AI, and, and again, this is what we've talked about before, is there's a good side and a dark side. Yes, it increases productivity, but increases in productivity have a dark side, which is lower wages and lower rates of economic uh, prosperity. So yeah, technology is awesome. We, uh, internet's been has been great. Again lower wages, lower economic prosperity, less full-time employment relative to the population. You know, you can go back and look at it and say, this is all great stuff. It's fantastic. But what's it really doing for us? Is it really creating a better world for our kids to live in? That's the real question should be asking. Yeah. And so as we go down this road, say, what's the real benefit of AI? Is going down this, this benefit, and look, I'm not making a case one way or the other, mind you, but I'm just saying that somebody should be asking, this AI is great, but what's this really going to do to our economy? What's this going to do to jobs? What's this going to do to families? And and, and again, Google is a if the inputs coming in are historically inaccurate. So when you ask for a picture of founding fathers, you know they're you know they are not what founding fathers look like. 
and there was a there was a big thing on the news this morning comparing Midjourney, which is another AI service that creates images just like the Google one does. And and Midjourney is historically correct. Google was 900 light years away from being historically correct, but it was all the biases of Google that were impacting it. So if AI, if the if whatever is ultimately going to be AI does not have the correct historical facts, then the information it produces is deleterious to the long-term growth of the economy because if we don't understand and know our history, we're doomed to repeat our history. And so if we keep whitewashing our history in order to create a different environment that we're in, we're going to start duplicating the, the same mistakes that got us into trouble to start with. Well, so yes. And and uh, I, 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 I want to be cautious around the term whitewashing because I, I don't think you are. And we're, we're, my concern, which I share, is not, not, not it's not, it's not an ethnically or race, racially based thing. It's just uh, if it's not truthful, right? And so we get we get back to the global corp thing, right? So uh, AI, you know, becomes uh, reality, and uh, everything uh, we get all our information from AI. All our content is AI generated. Whether it's a human bias or or an AI intelligence bias that starts to say, "Hey, I actually want people to be influenced in one way or another," right? We'll never know, right? because all our content sources will be singing from the same song sheet and we're not going to have any way to disprove it because it'll be an AI world at that point. Right. It's, so it's, it's basically Fahrenheit 454. And that's 451, but yes. Burned, yeah. That's, um, well, that's why the firemen burned the books because they had, they had, if you go read the book, they had transferred everything from print into digital, slightly changed the narrative when it went digital to create the outcome that they wanted. And then they burned all the books. Right. So you had no factual basis. And it's actually interesting because we're seeing a lot of this. My wife and I have been having this conversation now for a couple of months because, um, you know, for instance, the song um, by Queen, right? We are the champions. How does that song now, Adam, how does that song end? What, what's the last few words of we are the champions when the song ends? Oh, my yeah. God. Uh, we are the champions of the world. Um, God, I, I, if, 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 if no, you weren't telling it. me on the spot, I could get it. But no, 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 no that's it. We are the okay. champions. We are the champions of the world. Yeah. Except when you listen to the song now, it just says we are the champions, and the song ends. And so there's a whole big debate running around right now that no, that's the way the song is. It never said we are the world. And everybody that I talk to that grew up with that song goes, no, it ended. We are the champions of the world. Yeah. Fruit of the Loom says that they never had the cornucopia on their underwear. People are finding old pairs of underwear with a cornucopia on it. So, you know, we're we're just going through this whole time warp where things that we are that we that were true before have been changed in this timeline, so to speak. And now there's this big debate going on about what's real and what's not. All right. So so you're raising an even bigger existential thing that I was going to raise, but but you're basically, you know. We should be having a national discussion about AI and the role we yeah. want it to have, and 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 obviously the pace at which we pursue it, right? Because we could end up at the dystopian endpoint you're sort of warning about here, which is like we'll just never be able to trust anything, and 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 we'll be victims of the manipulation of our reality, right? Right. Um, well, good, well, the good thing is, is once all us old people die, then there'll be nobody to debate the issue of whether. We are the world, champions of the world. Was at the end of the song or not? It'll just be that. This will be what it is. So you just got to get rid of this generation, and then you're good to go. Yeah. Well, I, I, they're they're hustling us towards the door. Um, exactly. But but there, there's one other big issue about AI that's that's relevant to this, and, and we've talked about it once or twice in the past. But the economist Keynes actually coined this term, technological displacement, yep. which is, um, hey, if 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 technology can replace human labor, you should do it. It, it, it's more efficient, it's more economically effective, but you have to be careful of the pace at which you displace that labor. You you got to displace the labor at a slower rate than you are transitioning the displaced labor to additional productive use. And I think what AI threatens to do here is displace a lot of labor really fast and not give it a, another place to go, yeah. right? So, you know, the promise we have is, oh, you'll have more leisure and convenience. And it's sort of like, you know, whenever that tends to happen, like we have all the world's knowledge in this device right here, 
and what do we do with it? We watch, you know, the TikTok videos and cat videos and stuff like that, right? Like, send me, you know, send mean text to people we don't even know. So send me, yeah, and we 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 sit at home and and get depressed and feel, you know, lonely and but, and all this but, stuff, right? But but that's my whole point is is that you, you go back and look ever since the really ever go back to the advent of a Federal Express, and yes, we're making things more and more convenient. Technology is certainly displacing labor. And you know now we have these conversations. Uh, I was listening to this uh, congresswoman out in California, and she's advocating for fifty dollar hour minimum wage. Yeah, that's great, Barbara Lee. Yeah, yeah, Barbara Lee. Thank you. Um, but no, the whole point is though is that you know you take a, and we talked about McDonald's before, and, you're, you're, and you know have a fully automated McDonald's. You know, there's no employees whatsoever. And look at how many jobs when you walk into to places now have kiosks to order, and and they've displaced you know cashiers and. There's a lot of a lot of places won't even take cash now. You've just got to use you know debit or credit, um, you know, so they have to deal with that, you know. But we're displacing labor right now at the bottom end of the labor curve, so we don't really worry about it. It's like, oh yeah, it's just those lower end wage workers that are getting displaced by technology. You know, us in the white collar community, we're all safe, fine, and dandy. Well, you're not safe, fine, and dandy from AI because AI can do engineering, it can do legal, it can do accounting, it can do it can do it all. And there's no job that'll be safe. Not, you know, doctors, you're on the chopping block. Because once AI figures out how to operate the robots that do the do the operations, we don't need you anymore. So, you know, there's there's a, a lot larger risk of, of job displacement and economic displacement from AI than there was even from just the advent of the internet and and you know, technology in terms of like apps and you know programs. If you no, I totally agree. And that's what I'm warning about is, yeah. is we end up creating, you know, a, a very material displaced uh, class of, of labor that was, that is now productive, but in 10 years may not be. And a lot of it might not have a lot of other options, right? Because we've, we've, we've mechanized and automated and outsourced all the, the, the lower skill jobs and AI is eating more and more of the higher skill jobs. And what do we do? You know, and, and, and that's when programs like, you know, MMT and just, hey, you know, everybody stay home and subsist on your government subsidy. And I don't think it's a, well, I, yeah. I don't think anybody aspires to that world. Well, right. But that was, you remember um, when, when under the Obama administration, when we first launched the Affordable Care Act and we were talking about, you know, increased benefit, health benefits and all this at a lower cost. And, and I think it was Nancy Pelosi, don't quote me, but I believe it was her. It's that time is like, well, you know, because of this plan, you can just stay home and you want to learn to play the guitar, play the guitar, right? But at some point, somebody's got to produce something in order to have an economic society. We can't just all sit at home and be artists because if we were, who's going to produce the canvas? Who's going to produce the paint? Who's going to produce the brushes? Somebody's got to be working somewhere, right? And, and this is the fallacy behind this whole idea of MMT and everything else is like, oh, you'll just have all this time to just, pursue life and, and be happy. And the government will pay for everything. This is the whole World Economic Forum. You'll, you'll rent everything, you'll own nothing, and you'll be happy. I'm not sure that that works in reality because everybody's now at the at the very bottom end of the wealth scale. And I'm not sure they're actually happy there. No, I mean, they're, look, so anyways, like I said, it's not a future we want to aspire to. Look, I, I got to bring it back to uh, to some of the economic stuff while we, we still have time here. Um, so uh, bonds. Um, yes. So two things. Um, so the the FOMC uh, minutes were released this week, um, and they they show that actually most of the Fed, most of the folks on the the Fed Open Market Committee, um, if they had a bias, it's a bias towards not cutting too soon, right? That uh, hey, we do you know we 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 think we could create more issues if we're too optimistic here, right? So um, and 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 this week we had three Fed officials, Cook, Jefferson, and Waller, um, who reinforced the message that um, you know they're they want to be cautious. And and Waller kind of freaked folks out this week, saying in a speech, uh, "quote Whatever word you pick, they all translate to one idea: what's the rush?" Right? So you know. Coming into this year, the markets thought, all right, you know, Fed's pivoting now and we're going to get a bunch of rate cuts and they're going to start right away. Everybody was thinking that uh, they were going to start in March. 
Um, now that seems very much off the table. The market, as usual, has been forced to bring down um, its estimate for a rate hikes for the year. I, th I think it's now close to, to three. Yeah, um, the, the, that, right, yeah. so the, the expectation by the market to rate cuts is now the same as the Fed. Now the same as the Fed. But the Fed may very well now have to push out. Uh, it's the start of, of its cutting, right? Uh, one, because inflation, you know, still being a little bit stubborn here. Um, and two, you know, with this melt up in the market, um, financial conditions have gotten real loose. <laughs> yep. So um, I, I guess the question is, is um, for the bond market, what is what is uh, what is higher for longer mean? If that's indeed we, what we have versus recent expectations a and related to that, what is stickier for longer? Look, you know, if inflation does prove to be stickier for longer. Well, it just means that that rates won't come down, you know, a lot. So when we started talking about the bond trade last year, right, we said, look, you know, this is our outlook for 18 to 36 months. And, you know, so here we are about eight, nine, 10 months into that that debate. And because rates haven't gone to zero, everybody's going, well, maybe rates won't go down that fast. Well, yeah, they're, they were never going to go down that fast. That's when we said 18 to 36 months. It's going to take a while because you've got to slow. Look, as we've said before, we've done we've done this math numerous times. Interest rates are a function of inflation and economic growth. So if inflation gets stuck at three, three and a quarter, and economic growth slows to you know three or two and a half, then yields will eventually work their way down to two and a half to three percent. So you know right now yields are about four and a, four and a quarter, a little bit, uh, actually a little bit below that today, right around four percent. So yields are overvalued relative to where inflation is and where economic growth will be over the course of this year. So as economic growth continues to slow, yields will fall, but it's going to take time. They're just not going to go down. Now, as soon as the Fed starts cutting rates, yields will fall more quickly because now the Fed is actually lowering that interest rate on the short end. So the long end will come down with the short end. But you know that's all going to ultimately reflect back. So if you just if the Fed goes to two percent, inflation gets to two, which it will over time, then yields should at the minimum be two. And if we're in a recession, then yields will be near zero. Right. Right. All right. But but in in the short term here, um, by short term I mean you know maybe the next two quarters or so. Um, you know you and in... four. Pardon me. You might be stuck right around four for the next quarter or so. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so I know you and your partner, Mike Leibowitz, um, you know, a couple months ago were saying, Hey, you know, we, this may be the time to go further out the duration curve on, uh, on bonds. Um, are, are you kind of putting that on pause right now? No. Are you continuing no, 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 with that no. process? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, you know, whenever we get an uptick and in, in, like we got to four and a quarter uh, here just recently. And so we moved some of our short end, uh, into to longer duration. And so we're just shifting the whole ladder of the bond portfolio, continuing to use, you know, uh, upticks in yields as an opportunity to shift out that duration. So again, if we break four, um, then we'll move that duration a little bit quick, more quickly, because, you know, the, if we break four, sustain below four, then the next move will likely be lower towards 3%. Okay. Okay. So, um, again, you know, the problem that, that, you know, people have is that, you know, they like this idea of the bond trade, but they have no patience for it. Well, they're looking at it as a trade, like, okay, yeah. this is something I'm going to be in for a very short period of time. And you, you, yeah. you've said, to your point, it could take up to 36 months. So, I mean, you're being yeah. consistent. It's, it's, it could be longer. I mean, you know, there's, there's, you know, there's a risk. It could be four years. It could be five years. I mean, there's so many things that can happen economically over that time frame that the timing is always difficult. But what we do know is that because of the debt, because of the deficits, because of where economic growth is, that yields will be lower, not higher in the future. Okay. Um, uh, all right. Uh, so key thing for folks, because I get asked this in between our videos every week, I'm sure you do too. Yeah. You guys aren't changing your tune. You're not sweating bullets at all. Uh, on what? Bonds? On bonds, on your bond position. Oh, yeah, no, not at all. No, we're very optimistic on bonds. And and like I said, we're just, uh, if you take, actually take a look at the 10-year bond yield, it's been kind of basing very nicely right along support. Uh, turned up nicely today, as a matter of fact. So we may have another bottom put in uh, for bond yields short term. So there might be a potential for a little short-term trade here. If you're just looking for a short-term swing trade, we're up for 
uh, it won't be big, it might be like where we are to, you know, say like we were at four and a quarter, maybe to 3.9 and then you're out. But uh, no, long term, we're very optimistic that bonds are going to outperform stocks most likely. OK. Um, all right. I want to switch to a uh, another topic here real quick, um, just to kind of uh, track what's happening with the consumer. Um, you can hopefully see my screen here, Lance. Um, but there's a, uh, a, a report that just came out here that talks about how Americans are facing a credit card debt crisis. So you know, you were talking about how um, small businesses were, you know, increasingly struggling here, um, and we're facing issues with with their debt uh, re rate that's coming up. Um, you know, we're seeing something similar with the consumer market. So I'm going to try to uh, display some of these charts uh, at their full. Uh, full resolution here but here is a uh here's a chart of um uh total debt and and um it, it basically showing that consumer debt is continuing to spike and took a big spike you know no huge surprise hold, 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 hold on a second so that's actually counseling volume by month so these are the number of clients that are getting debt counseling right exactly Oh, and then debt, the debt balance is on the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. That's very interesting. Okay. Keep going. Yep. Okay. So, you know, more, more people are raising their hands and saying, Hey, Hey, I, I need help here. Right. I'm, I'm taking a little too much debt. Um, if you come down here, uh, you can see, uh, this is a chart of, um, serious loan delinquency by loan type. And you can see that it's, it's really starting to pick up now, particularly in autos, which is the green line here. Uh, and then in credit cards, right? So you can see the credit card delinquency rate um, has gone from what about three percent uh, in uh, Q1 of of 2022. Uh, it's now over double that. Yeah, it's Here. interesting. The student loans aren't showing a, a delinquency pickup because we are seeing since the restart of the student loan payments, there's a very large percentage of them that aren't making them, so they're just not reporting them as delinquent. Yeah, and you can imagine optically, they probably don't want to heading yep. into uh, uh, an election, election. right? Yeah. Um, and then here is a rise in um, credit card debt. Uh, to, to, sorry, sorry. The yeah. Uh, let's see here. This is this is yeah, total, delinquencies. Total debt, yeah. Yeah, these are delinquencies in total debt, and then in credit card debt. And let me just mm -hmm. see if I can get a a bigger picture here for folks. Um, but the the blue line is total debt, and you can see that that is actually picking back up again. Um, not not quite where it was um, pre COVID, um, but that's because you know there was both debt pay downs that happened as well as you know huge forbearance programs. But but the trajectory isn't very good. But look at credit card. I mean, credit yeah. card debt is at a much uh, a, a much higher, faster trajectory here. Um, I'm interested in what this doesn't include, but I'm I'm looking for data on. I haven't been able to get it is I want to see what the delinquency rate on these buy now, pay later programs looks like. Yeah, I, so do I. Um, I and I, I, I feel like uh, whatever it is now, it's going to be some multiple of it in about a year. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, buy, buy, buy now, pay when? Yeah, or pay never, right? That's what folks are saying the, uh, the end stands for. Uh, and then the last chart here I want to show is... Um, this chart here, which is, um, you know, the, the, the debts are increasing, the total debt volume is increasing. But as we've been, you know, waving a lot of this program, Lance, the average interest rate on these credit cards um, has, is much higher than it's been. It's at record highs now. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the consumer is, is really in a tough spot here. So no, no wonder that we're beginning to see these, these delinquencies. And, you know, you're, you're familiar with this as as we've seen and we've gone into previous recessions, the delinquency rates, they they remain low. And then once they start getting into trouble, they tend to just spike real fast. It's usually just over a quarter or two. Um, and the same thing happens with home foreclosures and whatnot. And they're not they're not seeing too much trouble yet in uh, in mortgage defaults, although I have heard that that they're beginning to see sort of some some precursors uh, to 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 uh, increase in foreclosures and mortgage defaults. Um, obviously, we'll be tracking those really closely, but it seems like the the, the weaker points, right? The people that have high credit card uh, balances and are, are have no other choice but to to put stuff on the credit card for as long as the card companies will loan to them, you know, they're starting to fall into trouble here. Yeah, 
And look, and this is, you know, as we talked about before, is that, you know, the economy is doing fine right now. But, you know, all those stimuluses, all those supports, all those bailouts, they're, they're coming to an end. And, and so, yes, we're not in a recession yet. I don't think we'll be in one this year. It's, it's possible. But, you know, given the fact that we're still running about three and a half percent GDP growth, that's still a pretty big decline that we've got to get to get to zero to go negative. Um, you know, but, you know, 2024, I think is a real possibility. I think, you know, this is why I find it interesting, you know, in 2022, all experts thought we were going to have a recession. Now, nobody expects one, which is, as Bob Farrell once says, when all experts agree something else tends to happen, you've now got a good setup for having a recession because now everybody's in the Goldilocks camp. Right. Well, I mean, as you just said, the NIFB just threw in the towel, right? Yeah. <laughs> not, no, not FNIB, conference board did. Oh, conference board did. Okay, yeah. sorry. Um, but, but yeah, so, I mean, that, that, that tends to be sort of one of those classic turning points, right? It's almost like a, like a, like a economist or Barron's, um, yeah. front page article, right? Exactly. Usually whatever trend it's touting, that's the high watermark and then it, then it reverts. <laughs> um, all right. Well, look, um, I, I, I want to get to your trades and, and get to uh, a rant or two, um, real quick. I just wanted to make a brief note of, um, uh, I'm, I'm probably going to pronounce his name wrong, but is it Malay? Um, is, is, is that the Argentinian president? Um, that is the Argentinian president. I just not, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name correctly or not. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, firebrand politician, total outsider, you know, came in with a, a, a um, platform. He was going to clean house um, economics, you know, the, f reversing the economic issue of the country was issues of the country was you know the main part of his his platform. And he has secured the first budget surplus in Argentina since 2012, after just one month in office, right? And I don't know the details of it. I pretty much just noted the headline. But what I wanted to note is like, um, you know, if indeed he has done that, kudos to him, right? And uh, and not sort of unlike Elon Musk, when Elon Musk got rid of 70% of the employees at Twitter and has been running the company ever since, you know, with the remaining 25%. There's a lot of things that we just think in, in in our current system are just not possible because that's just, we've gotten so conditioned to the rules by which the system operates that we just don't think that they can be revised in any material way, right? And we, we get so used to a certain way of doing something that we just think, ah, that, that could never happen, right? And when you get a change agent that comes in and says, yeah, and hey, this this might not be easy, it might not be painless, but we can do this. We can choose to do this differently. Um, I think back to, uh, I'm sort of making a tangential comment here, but I think back to the interview I did with Doomberg about um, energy supply, future energy supply. And he made the comment that uh, political constraints are much easier to overcome than, than geological ones. Meaning, you know, there's, there, 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 there are big parts of our, our current energy supply system that are only the way they are because of, of, laws and regulations and decisions that we put in place. We could change those tomorrow. Yep. It, it seems unfathomable to people that we might, but we could, right? We yep. could decide to do things very differently, right? So the fact that Malay is coming in and, and basically saying, look, we've had this basket case of, a, of an economy for you know the past 10 years and then is able to get a budget surplus in this first month shows that, hey, yeah, folks, th things are really possible. Now, we might break a lot of things. A lot of people might lose their jobs that, that had cushy jobs or were, were committed to doing it the old way. But but change is possible. We just have to open our imaginations to it and have the, the discipline and the courage to do it. Yeah. No, that's absolutely right. Of course, right. we still have politicians that will do that. Yeah. And I mean, again, I'm, I'm amazed. Again, I, I don't know the details of how he might have engineered this. Um, and, you know, I think one question with this guy is how long is he, you know, going to be allowed to do it before he gets a dagger in the back or whatever, but we'll, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> um, all right. Well, look, uh, trades. Um, what trades have you guys made over the past week, if any? Um, basically, we, uh, you know, before the, um, I, now, I said this earlier in the show, but just to recap, we, we trimmed back on NVIDIA, AMD, um, we also bought, um, had a position in Diamondback Energy that bought Endeavor, uh, which is one of the largest uh, Permian Basin plays in Texas. And um, they bought that as a private company. Uh, stock was up, you know, 15, 18% on the news. And so we trimmed that back a little bit. It just kind of got, it, it's been running up a lot more than the rest of the energy drillers. 
So we just trimmed that back a little bit just to bring in some profits, uh, you know, because again, we'll probably get a bit of a correction in the energy space, but energy is actually looking pretty good. So we, we kind of like some of the energy names that we hold right now. We think those will do better as we get in, uh, head towards summer. Um, also, we get a rotation. And then uh, outside of that, we did buy a very small starter position in Palo Alto Networks uh, because of their cybersecurity exposure um, on this recent pullback. It's a company we've meant one to buy for a long time, just couldn't get a good entry point, finally got one. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, part of a good you know, capital manager is to look for good entry points. And as you said, their stock was down, what, like 26, 27%? 26 percent sitting on the 200 day moving average so again this is you know that's the one thing we keep talking about a lot is that these stocks that are grossly deviated from their 200 day moving averages those are like magnets eventually they're going to correct back to their 200 day moving average and so when you get that opportunity those are often good entry points okay and as an entry point <clears throat> are you are you taking sort of like an initial position and then hoping yeah. to get more? Or was this like, a, yeah. oh my gosh, no. this is on sale. Got to get to buy as much oh, as possible. No, no, no. When, when you have a stock that drops 26%, generally what you'll get is you'll get a bounce out of it. And then everybody, you know, all the kind of the retail traders that were chasing it on the way up and they wake up one morning and they're down 26, 27% of their position, then they're, they, they, they fall into the trap of, okay, Lord, if you'll please just let me right get some money back, you know, I'll sell it and I'll never buy the stock again. So you generally get the stock to run up a little bit because, you know, bottom bottom fishers come in uh, like us. And then when it runs up, you get all the trapped, what we we'll call trapped longs. They sell, price comes back down, forms a second bottom. And then that's the point where we'll take a much bigger position. Okay. All right. We'll look hitting into the, into the rant part of the day. Um, and this doesn't have to be that long. Um, but, uh, you and I have talked about this, uh, this theory that, um, you know, when my wife calls it, she's a marriage family therapist and, uh, uh, with teens, she calls it the five monkey, um, syndrome, which is you're, you're the average of the, of the five people that you choose to spend most of your time with. Yeah. Right. So choose wisely. And you've said the same thing with your kids, right? You've, you've encouraged them to do the same thing. <clears throat> um, and I, I think that's true in life. Uh, kind of about whomever you choose to associate with, right? And that's that's true of, of, of business partners and contractors and vendors that you work with, um, things like that. And um, so, uh, you know, if, if you want to be successful in life, uh, very important to pick wisely in terms of, you know, whom you, whom you choose to do business with and work with and, and, and learn from and listen to. And in general, you should always be on a journey of like constantly upgrading, Right, um, especially with um, uh, like the the professional um, the professionals that you work with. So you know, for example, I probably I can't tell you sort of how many accountants and lawyers uh, that I've I've worked with because I've I've worked with you know worked with one until I found one that actually you know met my services needs better. Right, and I, I just kept trying to upgrade you know e each provider okay. as I'd go along. Yeah. But I agree with you. Upgrading is great, but not with your wife. So yeah, I said, <laughs> well, that, that that that's because you want to make the best decision the first time that you can. Exactly. Um, uh, and, and an important part of that, and this is sort of where I'm going, which is, um, it, it it's the ha having the the wherewithal, the awareness, and the courage to cut bait, um, or or you know to to address issues, and if they can't be quickly resolved cut bait early on uh, in, in these relationships. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times I have, uh, and I, I, this all came up because I was wrestling with one provider right now where I've, I've just been like, I've just been not quite uh, satisfied with it for now I'm realizing a lot longer than, than I should have been. Um, and so the ability to say, look, this isn't personal, it's just business, but these are the requirements I have. And I keep finding myself just not getting exactly what I need from your service or from this relationship or whatnot. Um, and, and having the ability to say, um, look, it's, it's, it, it's not on you. It's just, it's just not a good fit. And uh, I'm, I'm going to have to go elsewhere. Pardon me. It's not you. Well, it's it, whatever, it but, is. but the, the point is, you know, we're, we're all conflict avoidant in general. Um, I think a lot of times too, people will sort of hire a, a, a professional to, to do a service for them. 
and just have the assumption, well, because they're a professional, they're obviously going to do a good job and they kind of let it go on autopilot, right? Um, but I think there's a, a, a real value to, um, you know, being really honest with yourself and saying, look, you know, for what I'm paying and what I need, am I getting the value that I need? And if I'm not, let me address it right away, however uncomfortable that conversation or series of conversations might be. And if it's not going the direction I want to have it go in, hey, I can end it and I can transition to somebody better. Yeah, and it's going to take some time on my part to do legwork and find somebody better. Maybe there's going to be a gap where I, I, I've left the other person and I haven't found the next person yet. Um, but I, I just think back in my life where I have you know, either stayed too long in situations. One famously in my mind is yeah, I worked for Yahoo for almost a decade about halfway through there, I was realizing I wasn't really growing and developing that much. And I got pretty advanced in discussions with Google. And then uh, I, 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 another opportunity at Yahoo came in and against sort of my better judgment at the time, they kind of pulled me in and said, oh, we really need you for this and please stay for this. And and I ended up uh, you know, spending time on that and the opportunity at Google went away. And, and you know, now that I look back over time, I'm like, oh my God, I would have been so much better served if I had gotten to Google then, both both financially, but also just in, in interest in what I'd been doing. Um, and so uh, I, I guess where I'm just going with this is to, to encourage people to kind of, you know, look at the association of folks they have around them, ask themselves whether it's a personal relationship or a business one, is this serving me the way that I, I hope it will? And if not, say, okay, look, where are the ones where I need to sit down and have what might be an uncomfortable conversation, but one that can hopefully break me through to, you know, uh, an elevation of getting to a better place, either with that person or with a, a replacement, if I've got to go out and find a replacement. I think way too many people, you know, out of avoidance or whatever, just don't do that. And you end up sort of just getting stuck with something that's, that's uh, you know, non-optimal. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it, the, the really kind of the key issue is expectations. And this, this goes for marriage as well as it goes with working with people for business or, you know, even your, like your financial advisor. You know, we often have expectations of, oh, this person is going to do ABC because, you know, that's what I perceive their role to be. And this is what I expect them to do. But you never actually communicated that to the other person. And this is a big, uh, this is a big problem in marriages that there's this on both sides, right? You know, the, the wives expect the husbands to do certain things that you don't do, but they didn't tell you. Um, and same thing, husbands kind of expect their wives to do certain things that they never express. They just assume that this person would know. And again, with fi I, I can talk about financial advisory because this happens yeah. a lot in financial advisory. But, but by the way, you're describing about 95% of my wife's uh, you know client meetings. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, no. This, expectations this, and communication were not lined up. Yeah. <laughs> well, right, and that's and but that's ultimately always the problem, is that you know cl our our clients will come in is like, well, you know, I was expecting I was going to get fifteen percent a year. It's like, well, a you never said that because we would have never taken you on as a client if you did. You came in and said you were super conservative and didn't want to lose money. So you know, expect you know communicating your expectations with the people you're dealing with up front is crucially important because you can save yourself a lot of time because if you go, you know, hey, I want 15% a year in returns, I'm going to tell you up front, hey, can't do that. You know, you need to go find another advisor. So you just saved yourself the whole time of having to go through a period of, of lost time. So, or if you come to me and say, you know, hey, this was my expectation. Okay, great. That's reasonable. I can certainly meet that. You didn't tell me that before. I didn't realize that was your expectation. But now that I know, I can certainly meet that for you. And so you can create a better relationship with whoever you're dealing with, including your wife, if you'll just communicate. And, and you know, communication is hard because you're always worried about two things, right? You're worried about offending their feelings or you're worried about rejection. And, you know, neither one of those are bad. It's just they're uncomfortable. And, we don't, and, and to your point, Adam, we don't like being uncomfortable. But if you can learn to deal with being uncomfortable, you'll move a lot faster through your progress. Thank you for making that. Like that's the point I'm trying to make here, which is getting comfortable with discomfort. It's like a superpower. Um, yeah, it is. But look what we've done on social media. It's like, and like you, you even brought it up today on the show, just as just as an example, right? I said the word whitewash. Immediately, you had to go and say, well, you know, we're not talking about anything racial or anything like that. That's what social media has done to society. We're so worried about offending somebody's nature that we're not willing to speak the truth. 
And this is this is the problem that we are creating and engendering across society and why there's an inability to have a discussion about anything. Look, it is my right to offend you. It is your right to be offended and you can offend me back. That is okay. When we were growing up in the 70s, there was this old saying called sticks and stones may break your bones, but words will never hurt me. You know, that's just the way things are. But we're so worried about offending somebody or hurting somebody's feelings that we're completely destroying the ability to communicate with one another. And that's the worst outcome possible. Yeah. Well, and, and also there's 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 ways to do this, right, to, to, to go through discomfort where, you, you, you know, you don't have to be a bad person. It doesn't have to be yeah. a, a terrible experience. And, and one of the things that I've I've found has been really helpful in, in my professional relationships. And I'm, I'm going to take this in a certain direction in just a second. But is is just saying to one of the company, you know, if you've got a professional that you're engaging with for something, and you're not feeling like it's not clear to you if you're getting enough value out of it. You just say, "Hey, uh, I, I just like to talk about the fact that I, I, okay, we can agree I'm paying you X. How exactly are you earning that for me? Like, just just I, I'm ha I'm having trouble seeing it. I'm not I'm not making an accusation. I'm just trying to understand it. Can you please help me sort of break down why I'm getting how I'm getting what I'm paying for, right? And and it's a fair question to be able to ask somebody. It's a bit of an uncomfortable question to ask them, but if they can't answer it to your level of, of, of satisfaction, then yeah, who can argue if you say, well, hey, you know what, I, I just think maybe it's time for me to move on then, right? <laughs> See, you're way too nice. I just say, I don't feel like I'm getting what I'm paying for. Explain this to me. <laughs> so, yeah, well, it's, it's, I, I said a slightly more- I don't do the whole more, dancing around thing. Yeah. I just cut right to the chase. I said a slightly, but whatever, whatever your style is. But yeah, <laughs> but I mean, you, you, you don't have to like be finger pointy or get in, you know, shouting matches with each other. It's just, just keep it real focused on the facts. Yeah. Um, and, and and kind of related to this, this is this is just another thing I, I wanted to bring up is um, this is my rant, which is uh, for a lot of professional services, you know, whether they're I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times a day I get emails from media consultants and people that are offering services that they, you know, are going to catalyze thoughtful money to the next, you know, level of success. Yeah, yeah. But whenever I, I, I work with uh, or I, I initially uh, get in contact with a professional services provider, you know, the vast majority of them, they have a fee structure, right? And it's, here's my rate, pay my rate, and uh, and then I'll do what you want me to do for you. And, you know, in, in many of these cases, I, I, when I, whenever I've done it in the past, I've always been really begrudging going in because I'm like, look, if this doesn't work out, you're still going to get paid. I'm going to have already paid you, right? Yeah. And how many times have you, especially with like a media consultant, right? Like how many yeah. times has somebody promised you the world and then, you know, you pay them their retainer or whatever. And as time goes on, you know, they come up with every excuse in the book of why, well, it's, for some reason, your business is different this time. It's not responding to the normal things that we do. Maybe if you give me some more money, I'll try this, right? Um, and and you, you begin to learn as you're just shelling out the money. It's like, wait a minute, this guy's got no skin in the game, right? Yeah. Like he's, he's just milking me and, and, and I'm not saying all, all consultants are like this, but there are a few that more than a few no, that kind just, of make their living on just... I'm going to always have several different clients and I just know that their average lifetime is going to be three to five months before they catch on that I'm not really, you know, adding that much value, but collectively they pay me a nice salary over time. Yeah. And, and, you, and you know how to weed through those guys really quick is that you tell them, say, look, I'll tell you what, I will pay you double your rate after the fact. So if you do what you say you can do, I will pay you double your rate. I do this to people all the time. And immediately they'll say, nah, that's not how we work. You have to pay us up front. So I know that they're going to be the person you just described. Every once in a while, I will find a guy that says, yeah, I'll do that. And I'll hire that guy. Well, and, and so you're taking and, this exactly and, where I wanted to take it. And, and nine times out of 10, they do exactly what they say they're going to do. And I'm more than happy to, to pay them more than what they're worth. Well, absolutely. If you, if you or, or at least, you know, you Pay them what it's worth to you to get the job done right, exactly. right? Well, yeah, that's my point, yes. Yeah. Um, so my, my point here is that um, you, what I have learned is that everything is negotiable, right? You ask somebody how much it costs, you know, a lawyer, an accountant, a marketing guy, whatever, right? And they say, well, this is my fee. And you say, okay, well, wait a minute. You know, like, here's what I really care about. Can we structure this in such a way that, you know, it's either performance-based, you know, I'm concerned about getting taken for a ride here. I want to have some protections in place in case you don't do your job right. Um, and you, you begin to kind of learn that in business and really in all aspects of life, absolutely everything's negotiable, 
right? If the person actually thinks they can provide real value for you and they want their business, they will work with you to structure in a way that makes you comfortable. And to Lance's point, you know, maybe you end up paying more under certain conditions, but but you've reduced the risk in those conditions. And if you're happy with that, you know, if, hey, if the guy actually does what he say and we agree on what the, you know, the, the outputs are, if they're hit, I'm happy to pay that amount. Like, that's the way to do it, right? So I, I just want to give people the 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 hope and the faith that like, hey, if you're feeling kind of taken advantage of, you know, folks that you're working with uh, professionally, you know, A, have the courage to have those tough questions and move on if you're not getting the answers you like. But when you're when you're reaching out to other people, if their initial offer isn't what you want, work with them to structure something differently. And if they're worth their salt, nine times out of 10, they'll do it. Or the other the other option is that they are worth their salt. And, and this is me. <laughs> People will come and say, will you do this for me? I'll go, yeah, this is what I'll charge you. And then they'll say, well, you know, that's a little more than I was thinking about paying. It's like, well, go find somebody else. Um, you know, because I know what I do. I know what I can do. And I know what my skill set is. And I know what my skill set is worth. And so if you run into that person that says, here's my fee, it's non-negotiable. And if you don't want to pay it, that's fine. Go away. That's probably a guy to consider, a guy or girl to consider also because they are that confident that they can do the job they promised to do. So either they will work on, you know, hey, pay me more. I'll perform first and you pay me more in the end. Or this is my rate up front. Take it or leave it. Those are probably the people you're looking for. Yeah, um, I, I, I want to agree with you on that second one. And I agree that there's there's probably half in that population that are so good that they, they're just demanding what they're worth. And I think there's another half there that just has a, a wildly outsized sense of their own value. No, no, <laughs> so and, you got to be careful. True, but, but, but yeah, you do. But I mean, but normally, if you go to a person, they go, "This is my rate," and that's it. It's non-negotiable. It usually means they have enough business elsewhere that they really don't need your business. Right. And and you know that's that's kind of the point I'm getting to. If they're successful in what they're doing, they really don't need your business. They're happy to take you on as a client, and they'll work for you but they're not going to negotiate the rate because they already know what they're worth because they've already got a big client list. Yeah. Um, and who knows, some of those guys probably won't do this, but, but cause, cause I agree, look, I'm, I'm totally on the, uh, on the, the train of yeah. get the best person to get the best act, like pay for quality basically. Yeah. Right. Um, and so if somebody does that, a, you want to make, you want to do the other due diligence to talk to previous clients of theirs and things like that to make sure that they're really legit in the real deal. But secondly, you know, say like, hey, look, I'm willing, I'm willing to take a flyer on you. You know, you're 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 not budging. You must be that good. But if there's a total failure of delivery, you know, I want term X or whatever that just says I'm not left holding a bag, right? And anybody yeah. who's who's worth their salt should be able to to agree to something there. Yeah. And, and kind of my point was more around like a neurosurgeon. You go to a top neurosurgeon, they don't negotiate with you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Yeah. And yeah. Um, <laughs> this is my rate. You want me to work on your brain? This is what it's going to cost you. Yeah. All right. But, but again, uh, you know, underscore here, you know, don't, don't languish in a relationship, professional yeah. or personal that's, that's not serving you um, developing the ability to have those tough conversations to get to a decision as to whether to, to reinvest or to cut bait. It's like a personal superpower. And know that you have a ton of agency in this, right? That terms terms for anybody are negotiable, right? Um, or, or you get to the point where the guy says, "Look, it's, it's this way or the highway," and then you you can choose, right? Yeah, so, all right. Um, well, look as we wrap up here, folks. Um, uh, if you uh, continue to enjoy these uh, weekly conversations with Lance and I, and uh, uh, await them just as eagerly as the next moon landing, uh, show us uh, that you feel that way by hitting the like button and then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. A reminder that the Thoughtful Money Spring Conference is, is coming up real quick now uh, on Saturday, March 16th. And don't worry if you can't watch the event live, everybody who registers will be sent replay videos of the entire event, both uh, all of the presentations, as well as all the live Q&A sessions. Um, a, a good note, too, we just locked in Melody Wright. She's going to be the real estate uh, expert for the conference. I'm very excited. I, I just talked with her about what she's seeing uh, most recently in the markets, and she's got some data that's really kind of eye-opening. Um, and a reminder that if you are a premium subscriber to our Substack, uh, you not only get the uh, lowest early bird price, uh, discount price, which is uh, going to be going away in just a week. So make sure you 
respond quickly to lock that in. But if you're a premium subscriber to the Substack, you also get an additional $50 uh, off of that lowest early bird price. Um, and uh, look, you know, Lance and I have talked about how this market is, um, the bulls are running, uh, but how long are they going to run for? And uh, if, if we do get a correction uh, in this, this uh, seemingly melt up that we're into, um, you know, what implications are that going to have for folks? Uh, for the average person, this is pretty heady uh, market action to follow. Uh, and, uh, you know, if uh, you get to a point where, uh, you know, the market starts reversing or important things in your portfolio need to, to be going on, like the, uh, the position sizing uh, that Lance always talks about, um, for the average person, we highly recommend that you leverage the expertise of a good professional financial advisor who understands and focuses on all the issues that Lance and I have talked about here, as well as all the macro issues that I talk about on this channel regularly with all our experts. If you've got a good one who's doing that for you, great. Stick with them. If not, uh, or if you'd like a second opinion from one who does, perhaps even Lance and his team there at Real Investment Advice, uh, consider scheduling a free consultation with one of the financial advisors that Thoughtful Money endorses. To do that, just go to thoughtfulmoney.com, fill out the short form there. Again, these consultations are totally free. Uh, there's no strings attached. There's no commitment to work with these guys. It's just a free public service they offer. Uh, Lance, as usual, I'm going to give you the last word here, my friend. All right. Have a great week. We'll see you back here next Friday. All right. Well, that was pretty All easy. Right. All right, Lance. Thanks so much for the end of the week. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching.